But how's this for something different? On this video, I'm joined by special guest Seamus Evans to chat about life as a neurodivergent person who has ADHD and Tourette's syndrome. Let's go. Welcome, my friend. I'm super grateful for you being here, so thanks for watching. I'm Orion Kelly, that autistic guy. I'm all about helping you raise your level of understanding, acceptance, and appreciation of the autistic community. If that sounds like something you'd be interested in, please hit that subscribe button. You'll check out all the videos and you'll join the best community on YouTube. I'm so excited to introduce you to this friend of mine. You've probably already heard of him. He's a TV presenter, radio host, keynote speaker, media magnate, the list goes on. He also happens to have ADHD and Tourette syndrome. Another amazing neurodivergent person to chat to. Seamus, thanks so much, my friend, for being here and welcome. Thanks so much for having me, man. I really appreciate it. We've, uh, we've had a very similar career in very different parts of the world uh, or in Australia. And we've only just met recently. So, and I'm so proud of your success on YouTube, man. And uh, I'm so happy to be a part of this. So thanks so much. It's great to connect and it's great to uh, have a chat. It is funny when we, when, we, when we chatted how amazingly similar our lives can be. And then you, you start to ask the question, mm, neurodivergent people and creative jobs, isn't that, isn't, it's interesting. It really is. <laughs> It's kind of spooky in a way. So my understanding is you have ADHD and Tourette's. Yeah, Tourette's syndrome and ADHD, yeah. So I've always known I've had ADHD, but I went to uh, start experimenting with medication recently. Now, working for myself, I kind of don't want to get up 20 times when I'm writing an email. So I um, I went to get some medication. I asked my mum. I said, hey, mum, where's my diagnosis paper? She's like, what? I said, yeah, when I got diagnosed with Tourette's, where's the ADHD one? And she goes, oh, you never got diagnosed. I was like, what? And so as, an, as a keynote speaker, you know, I'm going all over the country and I'm like, I've got Tourette's and ADHD. And, uh, and then I was like, gee, technically I haven't been diagnosed. So I just recently in the last year have went through that path, going into a six month waiting list for a, a good psychiatrist and then going, you know, four or five times, uh, getting the diagnosis and experimenting with the um, the medication. But yeah, Tourette syndrome and ADHD, they are, they are my neurodiversities. And I want to touch on them um, separately as we go through and definitely talk about the medication um, experiences. But I thought what, what would be really interesting for starters, because I think, uh, so this is the thing about neurodivergent stuff. Everything is so different. And a, a Tourette's syndrome, a, diagnosis i don't know i don't know anything about the whole idea of it and, and all that kind of stuff so i want you to uh, we're going to talk about it more specifically in a second but first i'd love it if you could share your story your diagnosis story about tourette's because i don't know if you're young you're old i mean it's, it, but it'd be a really really interesting story to hear <laughs> yeah well growing up i always had tics right like i always had like wrinkling of the nose blinking my sister called me blinky bill um, right from a very, very young age, like an infant. And a lot of family friends would always pick up on it and say, hey, hey, Seamus has got a bit of a tick. And mum was, I wouldn't say mum was in denial, but she would kind of brush it off and go, it's fine. It's just something he does. And then as I grew older and around the age of between eight to 10, it got really bad. Like we're talking tick fits. We're talking, you know, like grunting really hard, <clears throat> <clears throat> flicking my head, flicking my hands and not knowing what the hell was going on, freaking out and getting frustrated and my mum having to calm me down in the kitchen because it was just so overwhelming. And when you're at that age and you don't know what's going on, why your body keeps doing it, you feel possessed. Um, and it was then, so I called them habits because we knew nothing about Tourette's. We knew no, we had no idea what it was. Then my nana was actually watching a 60 Minutes documentary. And she called my mum and said, you need to watch this doco right now on Channel 9. Uh, this is exactly what Seamus has. And then we watched it and went, hey, that does seem, that does sound like uh, me. And then we begun on the, uh, going to the GP, then the specialists and things like that. And the age of 10, yeah, I got, I got diagnosed officially with Tourette syndrome. And to be diagnosed with Tourette syndrome, you need both motor and vocal tics. So you can have just motor tics, which is just tics, right? My brother actually has the step below Tourette's, which is, I think it's just called excessive tic syndrome. So he doesn't have any vocal. 
he's got motor, he's got blinking and he, you know, he catches things. And, um, and my brother had ticks growing up too. He'd always blow on his fingers. So it's definitely in the family. Uh, but I was the one who got the full blown Tourette syndrome, but I don't have coprolalia, which is what Tourette syndrome is famous for. And that is swearing the, the profanity tick. Copro Lalia, and how's this? The direct Latin root, the direct Latin translation of Copro Lalia, Copro meaning shit, Lalia meaning talk. <laughs> it's really interesting because Echo Lalia is something an autistic field can relate to, Echo Lalia, which is just the, re- the repeating of sounds and yeah. words. Uh, so there's there's a lot of there's an extraordinary amount of similarities with neurodivergent people, and and it's funny because you know. Autistic people watching might, and I, I thought the same thing. Might think, "Oh, hang on, you know, I kind of, I kind of do things that you were just describing, but we call them stimming. I'm regulating myself, but <clears throat> it's always the same amount of times. <clears throat> you know, uh, it's a regulation, it's a stimming, and it, it's it's amazing, it's amazing how I, I don't know how how we can all relate to each other in in, in different ways um, without actually experiencing." The same thing, and and for you know for those watching right now, this is a neurodivergent uh, video. So um, under no circumstances will Shamers be uh, masking or, or hiding, nor will I be editing. Um, so <laughs> you're just experiencing Shamers in, in all his glory. Uh, you mentioned the swearing thing because I mm-hmm. I agree, I 100% agree. Tourette's is just swearing. That's all Tourette's is, right? Like if. <laughs> You know, I'm, I'm a dude. I don't know anything about it. It's a swearing. Yeah. You're yeah. saying that? It's a, no, it's not. Uh, great. Okay. Let's smash some nips and let's talk some facts. What do we need to know about Tourette's syndrome? So Tourette's syndrome, to sum it up, um, everybody's brain self-regulates itself by firing off signals to the body, right? Like pistons in an engine. And that's everybody's brain, neurodivergent or not. It's a way your brain stays alive just to keep sending messages. But everybody's brain has a gate to stop the unwanted signals firing through. People with Tourette's have a weak or no gate. So those signals that the brain uses to stay alive just fire through randomly. And they are random. They have no connection to your opinion, your personality, nothing. They just fire through. So this is where it gets really complicated with people who are live, living with coprolalia. The things that come out of their mouth can be really offensive, you know, racist, can be sexist, misogynistic, horrible things. But it doesn't reflect that individual's uh, politics, their opinion. Their, it do, it, it do, it's like two separate complete entities. And that is where it gets really complicated. So Tourette's is obviously made famous by the swearing uh, condition, you know, coprolalia, because it's funny. Like, how can it not be? You have someone sitting there and then all of a sudden they go, penis, I have a penis. It's large. Come on. Like, that is hilarious. The difference really in lies with Tourette's can be hilarious and horrible. And it all falls on the individual. So I know some kids who have Tourette's and they take coprolalia in their stride and they make jokes about the fact that they, you know, have these profanity outbreaks. But on the other side, I know, you know, I know teenagers, they're the same age, they've got coprolalia, they're incredibly shy and they hate it. It's embarrassing and their personality can't necessarily handle that sort of social backlash. So inherently, it can be funny, it can be hilarious, but it all falls on the individual and how they're handling it. And I think that's where the difficulty comes from. So we've talked about the myth of the swearing. Mm. I think people, so put aside the idea that there's, there's the swearing. I, th- I think it's a fair to say people have got past the myth of just the swearing with ticks because of people like Billie Eilish and, that, and those types of celebrities. I think it's a lot more common for people to associate ticks. Are you finding that the people are more... Aware? Yes, absolutely. You know what? Not just Billie Eilish. Lewis Capaldi, he's got Tourette's as well. Uh, David Beckham. There are so many people. Seth Rogen. So many people have Tourette's. But you know what has made it more mainstream now? TikTok. Because, and I've noticed this, anytime I do TikTok, uh, Tourette's related content on TikTok, 
it skyrockets. It gets so many views. Um, I think because it is uh, extraordinary, it is not someone just cooking. Like it's a bit, uh, whoa, what the hell? Um, it, it's weird because I think people who aren't neurodiverse find Tourette syndrome, I guess, entertaining. So in that, Tourette's has absolutely gone to the limelight and is way more, I wouldn't say popular, but a lot more people are aware of it nowadays. But I would say because of TikTok more than anything. There was a huge, huge rise of people getting Tourette's when TikTok kind of became uh, famous, essentially, when it started rising as a new platform. And there's so much incorrect information out there. People are saying that TikTok gave me Tourette's. And that's not the case, not the case at all. Instead, if you look at it, you know, uh, kind of as a whole, TikTok rose to stardom during COVID. And when you, and, and it's aimed at kids, you know, teenagers, you know, 10 year olds. So that's when Tourette's usually kicks in anyway, around those ages of eight to 12. And plus the triggers for Tourette's uh, trauma. And also when you see something, your tick gets triggers. So if you're, think about this, if you're 10 years old, you can't leave your house, you've got TikTok. And so many people on TikTok are doing tick related, <coughs> tick related content, and you actually have Tourette's, bang, it's just triggered your Tourette's. So when P so what happens with Tourette syndrome is that actually lays dormant in your system until something traumatic triggers it off. So you can not have the symptoms but have Tourette's. So then you're 10 years old, you can't go to school, you can't leave your house, you're on TikTok, you see all these Tourette's related TikToks, bang, your Tourette's has just been triggered. And people are now blaming TikTok for giving me Tourette's, but that's not how it actually goes. It just seems to be that you know, they're on TikTok whilst in a traumatic time of life. Yeah, and I guess I can relate to it in the point of view that being autistic, there's a misconception that you can acquire it later in life mm -hmm. yeah, or, that it, or that it can be cured. So I don't know, I can't speak on your behalf. Uh, you know, you're, you're born autistic or you're not. You don't get it after that. And, you know, you don't cure it. It's not a disease. Yeah. Is Tourette something you're born with or can... So can you get it? Can you can you acquire a Tourette's or is it you know, you're born with it? Or well, if you have it, you have it, but the symptoms might not come in until later in life. So I have had it since I was an infant, but I know people who developed Tourette's at 21, so and even later on in life, like quite late. And this is a result from yeah, it laying dormant in your system until a traumatic event. So that's why. COVID-19 and being locked down, that kind of triggered it. I know a guy, he was 21 and he left Melbourne. He was driving home. See you later, family. And, you know, packing up his whole life and moving to Queensland. He got it on the drive. So if you've got it, you've got it. But it might not reveal itself until something triggers it. And there's also, the statistics indicate that it's one in a hundred kids have Tourette's and one in 200 adults have Tourette's. So I always say it's never going away. Once you've got it, you've got it. However, some statistics and studies show that people have grown out of it. However, in the two years that I've been a part of the Tourette syndrome community, meeting people all over the world with Tourette's, I would say it's more rare to grow out of it than it is. It lasts forever. When I was diagnosed, my uh, psychiatrist said I, it would be gone by the time I was 18 or 21. Mate, I'm 32. So if I always say, if you've got it, you've got it. And <clears throat> to be honest, that's a, I purposely make that decision to say that because having Tourette's, you've got to go through this real hard acceptance journey. Well, you have to kind of turn around and go, yeah, I've got Tourette's and it's not going anywhere. I have Tourette's. I am different. This is how my life is going to be, learning to live with it. Now, if you have it in your mind that it'll be gone by the time you're 18, well, then you kind of have to do that acceptance journey again. It's like you're being let down. Like I had to do that twice. I accepted it. Okay, cool. But it'll be gone when I'm 18 or 21. 
Then I was 23 and I still had it. So I thought, oh, gee, I've got to do it again because it's not leaving. So I think it's really important and I always make it a mission to say, hey, if you've got it, it's not going anywhere. I'm actually delighted of the similarities and experiences because it really helps the neurodivergent community feel like they're not alone. And, and honestly, uh, you know, so late diagnosis or, you know, you know, basically presenting and being diagnosed, you know, for me was an adult life, right? And it doesn't mean that my childhood was normal or the same, but just that's just when it presented and, and diagnosed. And, and, and everything you've said, you could change Tourette's for autistic and it would be the same legitimate. People watching this would have the exact same feelings that you have. And you're absolutely right. Once you receive a diagnosis, especially as an adult, there's this period you go through of who am I then? Yeah. What, what does this mean for me? You know, there's good, there's good and there's bad. And that also <laughs> filters through to, to professional stuff. We talked about our lives being pretty similar, you know, working in, in the media field. I'd love to know. So, okay, so you're navigating a career in media. We're talking radio, TV, uh, corporate gigs, all those kind of things. How is navigating a career in media and having Tourette's syndrome, how is it, how is it possible? Because people are going to say, hang on a second, you've got Tourette's and you're on the radio, you're on TV? What do you mean? How is that possible? Did you hide it? Share the experiences of how you navigate a, how you navigate a career in media. Yeah. Well, it's funny you say that because the amount of times on radio I had to turn the mic off to tick off... <laughs> And back on, when I first got my job, I was on Toasted TV, which is on, which was on Channel 10. It was a kid's show. And I didn't tell them that I had Tourette's. And so when they, when my, within my first week, you know, I'm sitting there ticking away and the boss pulled me aside and said, hey, whoa, 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 what's going on? Why do you keep ticking? I said, oh yeah, I've got Tourette's. I wasn't forthcoming in telling them. So then they kind of freaked out. <clears throat> and I, 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 I talk about this on my keynote because... Why are we afraid of the dark as kids? It's because we don't know what's in it. And so this particular boss, he had no idea about Tourette's other than what we've seen in the movies and no experience with an individual living with it. So he freaked out and he threatened basically, he said, well, you're still under probation. So if your Tourette's is going to be a problem, it's fine. We can fire you and get someone else. Now I failed school. This was all I ever wanted. This was the only thing I thought I could do was to be a television presenter. So I had to work on it. I didn't want to let I didn't want my Tourette syndrome to stop me and 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 be a a cap on my career. I didn't want it to hold me back. So I had to work with it. I had to learn. So I had to learn how to redirect them. I first started with masking and 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 in the Tourette's community we say do not mask. Because all it does is hold back your ticks, make you annoyed, frustrated, and you just let them out anyway. So I had to learn <clears throat> techniques to manage them and redirect them. So instead of large visual, <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> uh, 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 yeah, man, yeah, man, yeah, man. Instead of large movements like that, I had to learn, and it wasn't overnight. I had to put in a lot of management all day, every day, over a course of a few months to be able to control them and redirect them into different parts of my body so I could be on television without them being noticed. And again, going back to that acceptance journey, it was only because I sat down, I was in, a, in Lake Seamus without a paddle, and I just said, right, I have Tourette syndrome and I want to be a TV presenter. I need to learn to work with these and redirect them. Now, I had no idea. See, I, I was the only person I'd ever met with Tourette's. I knew no one else my whole life. And later in life, since becoming an ambassador for Tourette's Syndrome Association Australia, I have learnt that that's actually a method called CBIT, Cognitive Behavioural Intervention Therapy. I had no idea. Professionals, psychiatrists, they teach this. I just learnt it on my own. It's such an amazing story to hear because, again, there's so many things that jump up. Everyone, everyone can relate to this watching this video as an autistic person that... Uh, undiagnosed autistic person in commercial radio, I was just, you know, um, by HR and not a team player or doesn't play well with others or doesn't, doesn't say how to talk properly or you know, so I totally dig that. For an autistic person, when you, it's, everyone knows this, if you mask, the reason why you melt down and then burn out is because you've masked too long for too, you know, for too long. Yeah. So you know, too many, it, it, it's not possible. And, you know, unfortunately that's the price you pay for being different. 
in in the real world. We we talked about your ADHD diagnosis story, or let's call it the rush the rush job. <laughs> yeah. But I want to know. So same question, except ADHD. How does ADHD and obviously Tourette's as well? How does that impact, or how did that undiagnosed ADHD, though you thought you were already, how did yeah. that impact professionally <clears throat> as well, and also you know relationships, friendships, those type of things. I'd love to hear your <clears throat> experiences my brain is my brain and i was born with this brain so i my whole life have thought the way i think the way i do things is normal and it would be interesting growing up i remember the big thing i've noticed with adhd is your inability to regulate emotions and so within an hour i can have four or five different emotions i could be super hyperactive or feeling like I'm going to fall asleep right there, like absolutely exhausted and then bouncing with energy, then I can get super angry. And I would look at people and go, hey, how come How come you didn't just go through a huge emotional change? Like we've eaten the same thing, we've done the same activity, is it is it my sleep? And I, I remember my whole life going, how, how come I'm a bit different in terms of my energy levels, in terms of my emotions. Little did I know that that is actually an ADHD thing. Because your your brain struggles to regulate normal emotions, they come out in different ways or different areas. It's quite exhausting. So that was the biggest revelation for me, is the mood. And, and when I started experimenting with meds, the biggest thing I noticed was I had a consistent mood all day. And I was like, wow. Um, as well, when it comes to the attention side of things, right? My ability to keep focus and hold my attention is something I've had to work on for a very, very long time. That's why I failed school, because I didn't enjoy school. If you talk to anyone with ADHD, they can concentrate, but on things that they like. So they're gamers, right? They can sit in front of a game for eight hours, bang. You know, uh, there's a subject that they particularly, they, they, they'll be failing at maths and English, but they're obsessed with sharks and know absolutely everything about a particular type of shark breed. And so I think that's where we can't really focus on shit we don't want to focus on. <laughs> like it, we really struggle now. What I, And I didn't realize what ADHD was because my brother clearly has it and, and he's a bit of a, um, a masculine dude and with a bit of an ego and thinking he's pretty cool. He's a lovely guy. And he said, man, I just, you know, my brain was too fast for school. Like I would be talking about something. I'm like, come on, let's go on to the next thing. And a lot of people think that's what ADHD is. And I didn't have the heart to tell him, but I was like, oh, ADHD is actually a part of your brain that is slow. So information comes in here in point A and it needs to get to point B. But the path it takes to go to from point A to point B is slower than a non-neurodivergent brain, which means by the time it takes the information to travel down that path, we get distracted. So when yeah. we're sitting there and we're talking to someone and all of a sudden our brain goes, and it's off into another world, <laughs> that's yeah. because our own brain is getting distracted waiting for the information to go from point A to point B. And ADHD medication speeds that part up. That's as simple as I can make it. But last thing I wanna talk about, you have talked about medication with regards to ADHD. I want, I'd love to know, I'd love to know your experiences. I don't know if there's medication for Tourette's, so just, just explain it to me. What's, what have you tried medication wise and what have your experiences and lessons been? Because I, I heard, one thing I've heard you say is you tried the ADHD, and it absolutely regulated or managed your yeah. emotional state. And that seemed like you were, you sounded positive about that. So I have experimented with three medications and yes, they work. They speed up that part of the brain. They help you regulate your emotions. Um, they make you not wide awake at night because your brain is turned on all day. Uh, you can concentrate. Absolutely. They work a hundred percent. Personally, I've made the decision that I don't, like taking the medication and I, after the three or four months I've been experimenting with them, I'm done with them and I don't want to use them for me. Uh, the way I was always intending to use them was not every day, but on days that I had a lot of work to do and I couldn't be stuffed doing it basically. My whole aim was to not get up out of my chair, not watch TV, not check my phone a million times a day when I'm trying to write an important email. However, 
the reason why I've come to the uh, um, conclusion that I don't want to use them anymore. And people 30... are watching this, Seamus. People are watching this, by the way, and this is what they want to know. Like yeah. there's mums and dads and young people, they're watching this. And, you know, this is just one opinion, but this is a really important observation to make. So just be, just be clear. This is what people want to hear. Yeah. And, Why? And... Why stop? Why stop, yeah. they're saying. Why, Seamus? You said it was great, Seamus. What are you stopping for? What's wrong with you? <laughs> and to be clear, I think it's very important for an individual uh, to take medication seriously and to really weigh up every single pro and con to work out what is best for you and if it's best for you and if there are ever alternatives. Because 100% meds work. But I found that it took a little bit of my personality away. So with the 32 years of having ADHD, I call having ADHD fairyland. So that that distraction that I get where I did 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 did, 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 did off to nowhere, that's fairyland, right? I love fairyland. So many creative ideas come from fairyland. So many uh, uh, situations are mulled over in my brain in fairyland. When I'm on the medication, I don't have fairyland and I missed fairyland. I didn't realize this either, but there is actually ADHD therapy that you can use where it teaches you how to manage the symptoms. So I had to learn this firsthand when I was working on Totally Wild and I learned how to channel my um, <clears throat> hyper-focus because that's something with ADHD, you can hyper-focus, which means you are completely involved 100% and the house could be on fire. You're concentrated, right? And I learned this when I was on Totally Wild and I really enjoyed the job and I knew that I had poor literacy skills. So I had to completely immerse myself in the topic I was researching and I would bang, I would research every single article about this animal and I would write the script, I would research, I would just become obsessed and I would hyper-focus. Now, in that, I also had to train myself not to be distracted because I loved my job and I didn't want to get into trouble. Getting into trouble at school was not a problem because I hated school, but I loved my job and I wanted to succeed. So all of my efforts went, in, went into bettering myself at work and professionally and having a good reputation of being able to write a script to the deadline. So I would reward myself. So I'd say, right, just sit here for 10 minutes, do this, get up and get a drink. And then it would go, right, just sit here for 20 minutes and then get up and get a drink. Then it went to I was the ability to sit there for, and I went for like 15 minutes with 10 minute breaks all day. I think everybody, neurodiverse or not, should be able to reward themselves and do that because it gives you something to look forward to. But what I found is I was able to channel in my hyper focus on things that I enjoyed and I researched everything. To the point where, when it came to do the story, I knew more about the animal than the zookeeper because of my ADHD ability to hyper-focus. And I got better at uh, managing, you know, not getting up out of my chair, stop getting distracted. But that's a con it's like, it's like literally having a teacher stand there with a wooden ruler back in the 40s every time you move, whack! And I had to do that mentally to myself. No, Seamus, don't pick up the phone. No, Seamus, don't look that up on YouTube. No, Seamus, don't get up there and talk. Now, that seems like a great thing to do, but it's very difficult. The only way I was able to is because I liked my job and I had a long-term plan of being a TV presenter. And I knew every single time I got up out of my chair, that will affect my success. So I had like drastic ramifications for just getting out of my chair or getting something wrong in the spelling. It's almost like I would have this mindset of, if you don't do this one little thing, if you get up out of your chair, you're going to fail. Which then drove me to put in as much energy and effort into managing my ADHD symptoms of having a poor attention span every single day. You know what, for, for the neurodivergent community, so people, you know, people like me, like you, I mean, it's, I think these chats are so great because it's, we, we can not only learn about each other, but we can also feel a lot less alone. And I certainly feel like I've related to more of what you've said than what, what you haven't said. And my friend, I, I really uh, thank you for, for your time and thank you for chatting on the channel. And you, you, you're able to, you know, if you're watching this, you can go and check out our chat. 
on Seamus's channel. All those details are earlier in the video. If he wants any more ads, he's going to have to give me his brother for a week to do my post production or something. <laughs> anyway, but what, I, what I'm saying, <laughs> but what I'm saying is the man, the man, the man is fantastic. It's an amazing channel, like I said earlier. So please go and, and check it out. And uh, Seamus, it's been so good catching up with you, my friend. Thank you so much for being so open and honest, mate. Thank you so much for having me. I'm I'm really stoked to be a part of it. We've been talking about it for a while, and uh, yeah, I'm really stoked to be a part of it. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it, man. Not one neurodivergent person is like the other. We are individual humans, just like all humans. <laughs> I hope this video has opened up your eyes and broadened your horizons and started conversations. Thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. And if you liked the video, please share it with your family and friends so we can reach more people. Until my next video, thanks for your support. Thank you for watching. We'll talk soon.